Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Luke's Sunday Forum. I'm so thrilled to be with you today and even more thrilled to have this amazing conversational partner. This is a friend. This is a guest who is um, a companion of my soul. Um, we met several years ago, and we now have one of those friendships that's an eternal friendship. You will uh, experience that yourself in terms of all of his resourcefulness. His name is John Philip Newell, and I'll talk a little bit about who he is and why we're here and then get into some very enriching conversational questions. But for right now, let me just welcome my dear, dear friend, John Philip Newell. John Philip, welcome. Thank you, dear Ed. Great to be with you. Great to be with you. So John Philip and I met um, physically in Los Angeles. He was visiting, he was speaking uh, near Pasadena where I was the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. And he spoke two or three times during my tenure there. And the deepest time we spent together was when my wife Hope and I went on a pilgrimage with my international colleague group, the Urban Suburban Group to Iona, uh, John Philip was the leader of the Abbey at uh, Iona. We'll talk both about Iona and the Abbey uh, in a few minutes. Nevertheless, it is rather uh, considered to be the thin place in the world and also to be the kind of Mecca for those who want to feel and touch Celtic Christianity and Celtic spirituality. In its, in, in its most intense form. So in addition to all of that, John Philip is the author of many books. I'm just going to read some that have been very important to me. Rebirthing God, Listening to the Heart of God, a beautiful prayer book, which is an interfaith prayer book called Praying with the Earth. Christ of the Celts is another one. And then his newest book about which we want to speak today, sacred earth, sacred soul. So with all of that, let's jump in, John Philip, and tell me, please, if you don't mind, about you and Iona. Yes, um, I, Iona, as, as you said, uh, Ed, is considered a, a thin place. That is uh, a place where there's a thin separation between heaven and earth or between spirit and matter. And uh, when uh, George McLeod, the, uh, the founder of the modern day Iona community, first used the word thin about Iona, uh, he wasn't meaning that every other place in the world is thick. Um, he was uh, meaning that Iona is more like a sacramental place, a place where, where we can learn to pay attention to this thinness of the veil between heaven and earth that is everywhere present. So time on Iona is seen not as a, an escaping or moving away from the world or from the challenges of our lives and nations. Uh, rather, it's about um, accessing and seeing the immediacy of the divine uh, in a way that, that strengthens us to return to the ch more challenging places. So um, I, I studied theology in Edinburgh uh, beginning in the 1970s. And uh, when I was a young student of theology, uh, I heard uh, George MacLeod, Lord MacLeod of Funeray, uh, speak publicly. He was in his, uh, uh, he was about 80 by then. And uh, hearing him was, was like a sort of coming home experience for me. I, uh, hear, I heard a, a Christian teacher speaking about the sacredness of the earth, uh, talking about the nonviolence, the way of nonviolence as the way of true relationship between us as people and as nations. And uh, I, I had an awareness when I heard him, uh, and that was, I must find a way of, of um, staying close to this man. I mean, I, I didn't know how, how that was going to happen, but um, it was an awareness in me. And uh, shortly afterwards, the um, synchronicity of the universe 
allowed me to be on the island of Iona uh, um, uh, at the same time as George MacLeod and I met him as my wife and I walked along a path close to the sound of Iona. And uh, MacLeod uh, being a sort of Edwardian gentleman in his, uh, in his history and sort of upbringing, um, he, he called others by their last name rather than their first name. And this was a term of endearment. So he said, Newell, uh, come back for a whiskey. Um, so um, I, I'm not sure I'd ever had a whiskey at that point in my life and, and not at uh, not mid-afternoon. Um, <laughs> but when the great man invites you back for a whiskey, you go back for a whiskey. And uh, he invited us back to, to the house he was staying in. And um, we began to speak about such matters as um, nuclear disarmament, uh, about care for the earth, and um, at the end of that conversation, I remember, and I remember it more clearly now, I think, than ever, or I, I feel it more intensely now than ever, um, when he said to me, Newell, what are we going to do about all this? Mm. And uh, those uh, challenging words have been with me ever since. And uh, so Iona and MacLeod um, have been enormously significant in, in my journey. And then you had the opportunity and the grace to lead Ioma and that community there for how many years? Uh, for four years, my, my wife and I were uh, the leaders of the, the Abbey community. And um, what an extraordinary uh, place um, to be. Uh, the world in many ways converges on Iona. People come from from the four corners. And, uh, and they often come with tremendous openness. Um, they often come with a longing for healing in their lives and for their nations. And when people gather together with that sort of openness and depth of yearning in the heart, uh, all sorts of things can happen. Um, so I, I saw um, uh, vision awakening in many people. I, I saw um, profound changes happening in people's journey, including my own. Uh, so we're, we're so grateful for those uh, four years. And um, I continue to be on Iona every year now. Um, I, I lead four one-week um, international pilgrimage events on Iona. And um, as I um, I become less young and uh, wonder about <laughs> wa wa wonder about what I'm going to let go of. One of the things <laughs> I'm, I'm very sure of is that uh, I will, I think, never let go of the opportunity to uh, be on pilgrimage together with others on my own, and th that's uh, part of what we experience together, Ed. <laughs> so now we must go to Celtic thought, Celtic spirituality, Celtic theology. What is the essence of that, John Philip? I see uh, two uh, primary characteristics in this stream of spirituality that we refer to as Celtic spirituality. I mean, this is a modern term, but we use it to refer to a very distinct stream of Christian thought and practice that emerged in the Celtic world from the second century onwards. <clears throat> and uh, this stream distinguished itself from the predominant stream, stream of Mediterranean Christianity, uh, which of course by the fourth century had got into bed with empire. Um, and the, the Celtic stream characterized itself by uh, with, with two uh, primary emphases. One was a sense of the sacredness at the heart of every human being. And the second uh, re related directly to that, of course, is a belief in the sacredness of the earth and of all, um, uh, and of all creatures. Uh, I suppose a, th a third emphasis that I'd like to bring, and I certainly bring it in the new book, uh, and, and that is um, uh, we are needing to wake up to the, this twin 
sense of sacredness, the sacredness at the heart of you and of me and of every human being and the sacredness of the earth and all living things. Uh, and uh, the Celtic tradition celebrates uh, that we know this uh, deep within ourselves, um, but that we have lived tragically in a state of forgetfulness, uh, forgetting the sacredness of the so-called other, forgetting the sacredness of the earth. Uh, and uh, this forgetfulness has led us into the tragedy of, uh, uh, of what we are doing to the earth and one another as peoples and as nations. Um, I want to talk, I want to go deeper into that when we talk more about your latest book. Parenthetically, I'd like for us to journey a little bit into the distinction between Celtic Christianity and Mediterranean Christianity. There was a protectedness, is that the correct word, that Celtic thinkers and experiencers felt protected from the rush and the power and the domination and the coercion of empire. So that Celtic Christianity and spirituality continued to thrive even though the religion of Jesus was being squelched into a domination-oriented set of thoughts. Can you kind of flesh that out a bit? Yes, the, uh, uh, the earliest indications of, of what um, we can uh, discern as, as distinctively Celtic Christian theology. Uh, it emerges in the second century in uh, Celtic Gaul. Um, we sometimes think of the Celtic world as, as sort of limitedly Ireland, Scotland, Wales, uh, Cornwall, uh, but that's only the edge. Uh, and um, uh, from about five, uh, 500 BCE, the Celtic world spanned the whole of Middle Europe, ranging from um, uh, as far east as Turkey and places like Galatia, which just means the land of the Gales or the land of the Celts, uh, right through to Galicia, ancient Spain, uh, which means the land of the Gales or the land of the Celts, and took in uh, ancient France or Gaul, again, land of the Gales. Uh, and uh, it was only as the Roman Empire uh, began to expand and assert itself through other parts of Europe uh, that the Celts were increasingly pushed um, uh, towards what we now know as the Celtic world of, of Britain, Ireland, uh, Cornwall, Wales. Um, and uh, the first teacher of, of note uh, appears in second century Gaul, Irenaeus of Lyon. And uh, he uh, is distinguished in his thought by saying that uh, everything comes out of the womb of God. Uh, everything comes, in fact, he uses this extraordinary word, says that everything comes out of the substance of God, which is to say that this stuff, the stuff of the human body, the stuff of the body of the earth is sacred stuff. Uh, this, of course, uh, was not what empire wanted to hear. Um, Empire preferred, uh, of course, to neutralize matter um, and say it is not holy, it is not sacred in itself, because, of course, what empire wants to do, and this is true of the Roman Empire as much as it has been true of the British Empire and the American Empire, and that is uh, we have wanted to use matter um, for our own benefit and often abuse matter. Um, creating the situation that we're in today in which uh, planetary existence as we have known it is being threatened by this abuse of matter. So uh, the, the Celtic stream begins to distinguish itself from, the second, from as early as the second century. Then when uh, Christianity uh, becomes the religion of empire in the fourth century, uh, that division or that distinction between the Mediterranean stream and the Celtic becomes even more accentuated. And um, 
uh, when Rome is uh, is um, sacked in 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 um, by the barbarian invasions sweeping down through uh, Middle and Western Europe, uh, there is something of a of a a vacuum created between Mediterranean Christianity and the Celtic world. And that allows the Celtic stream to continue relatively unhindered until about the sixth century. Um, and those, those are um, in a sense, golden years in the Celtic world. That's when some of the significant figures like Columba of Iona, um, Patrick, um, Bridget of Kildare um, flourish. And that's when we see the real sort of heart of the Celtic tradition, uh, not only f flourishing, but expressing itself also in, in the great sort of art artwork and silversmithing of the Celtic world. Is it the case that it is accurate to say that for the Celts, that the first Bible was nature? Yes, <clears throat> I think it is, it is uh, uh, true to say that. I think the pre-Christian world, uh, um, especially in its druidic thought, uh, saw uh, nature as sacred and saw nature as like a sacred text through which the divine uh, could be encountered and known. And uh, one of the great uh, teachers later in, in the Celtic Christian tradition, uh, John Scotus Eriugina by name in the ninth century, uh, said that God is speaking to us through two books. Uh, one, he said, is the little book, the book of scripture, physically little, and the other is the big book, uh, the book of um, the earth, or the sacred text of the universe. And uh, he says, uh, we need to learn to uh, listen um, in stereo. Well, uh, stereo is not the word that he used in the ninth century, but uh, he, he said that we, we needed to listen to these two books uh, and allow them to inform one another. And very typically uh, what someone like Eri Gina is doing is building on this uh, pre-Christian understanding of the sacredness of the universe and uh, seeing the text of scripture, not in opposition to what we know in the great text, but rather uh, reading it in harmony with the great text. He said, um, if we try to uh, depend only on the little book, he said, the book of scripture, then we will be in danger of missing the vastness of the utterance, that everything is spoken into being. Uh, all things have been uttered forth by God. Uh, and he says, if we depend only on the big book and we ignore the little book of scripture, we are in danger of missing the intimacy of the voice. Uh, because scripture is so much about relationship, um, not only human relationship with the divine, but humanity's relationship uh, with itself in terms especially of, of relationship with the poor and our response to injustice. Uh, John Philip, I need to stop and breathe. That is so, it is so different from the toxic religious narrative that is dished out to so many people during their childhood. It is also so countercultural to the religion of America and America's feeling that we are the most important. Um, in my little travels in the world, I've been told by so many people in so many different places that when America sneezes, so many other countries catch a cold. And it is that kind of dominance, world dominance, that seems to be the antithetical to what you just described. Yes. Yes, I, I think one of the uh, things that I've so appreciated in many of these great Celtic teachers that I um, delve into uh, in the new book, especially, 
is that they keep addressing um, the, the need for us to wake up to our uh, true self, uh, to wake up to our true depths. And uh, in that uh, waking up to uh, the sacred core of our being, to at the same time wake up to the sacredness at the heart of every human being and to wake up to the sacredness of the earth. Uh, and um, there's a, a consistent call uh, to die to the way in, in which uh, the ego tries to place itself at the center. Uh, this is not to put down the ego. It, it, the ego is this amazing gift of consciousness and will that we have been given. Uh, but it is to say that the ego is not given to be the center, it is given to serve the center. And uh, by the center, I mean the sacredness at the heart of you and every human being and the sacredness at the heart of the earth. And this is a message that is applied uh, by the Celtic teachers, not only in relation to the individual ego, but also in relation to the uh, dangerous ego of nation or the dangerous ego of religion, or the dangerous ego of our species in, in which we have um, pretended that we are the center um, and that the rest of the earth is to serve us, rather than to see that the, well, the path of well-being is about uh, honoring uh, the sacredness at the heart of the other and knowing that same sacredness at the heart of our own being. And needless to say, we can easily add the centrality of race, class, yes. orientation, gender, on and on and on. Uh, yeah. And I know we didn't have to say that for you, but I just want to make those connections for people who are listening in. Yes, absolutely. I, I do want to get to your book. There is one other stop before we get to your current book, and that is to talk about what is symbolized and signified by your book, Praying with the Earth. It is an amazing artistic volume to hold in your hand and an amazing spiritual instrument from which to pray. I'd like for you to talk about your interspiritual soul, but also to mention your call for us to chant together also. That's been one of the amazing, wonderful gifts of John Philip Newell. Thank you. Um, one of the, the gifts of uh, spending many summers in, uh, in the high desert of New Mexico, uh, where my wife and I uh, had many weeks at the uh, conference center Ghost Ranch um, in, in New Mexico. One of the great gifts of, 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 of that time was the opportunity to work very closely with uh, a rabbi from Santa Fe and uh, a Muslim teacher from nearby in Abiquiu. And uh, the, these two um, um, Nachum Wardlev and Rachma Lutz um, became like sort of brother and sister to my soul. And uh, uh, through, through them uh, and through uh, that closeness of relationship, um, I, I came to see that uh, what my um, Jewish brothers and sisters and Muslim brothers and sisters looked to me for was not to some, somehow downplay my Jesus wisdom or Jesus inheritance, but to uh, offer it um, in, in this profound context of mutual reverence. Um, and that, of course, is what I look to them for as well. I, I look to my rabbi brother for his amazing uh, gifts of leading us in Torah study. And uh, I look to my uh, Muslim sister uh, for, especially for these um, uh, deeply moving practices and commitment to, to prayer. And um, 
So that was the context uh, in, in which I began to want to write that prayer book. Um, I wanted to write a prayer book in which I uh, could explicitly draw on the wisdom of the Quran, uh, the Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures. Um, so many of us in the Christian household uh, are unaware of, of the, the nuggets of wisdom uh, spiritual wisdom uh, that that one encounters in the Quran, um, not only unaware, but um, but so few of us have had opportunity to actually pray in and through the words of uh, the Quran or through Hebrew scripture. So we began to share one another's scriptures um, around the practice of of prayer. And it was also in that context that I, I provided the lyrics for um, a series of chants that, that drew on those three sacred scriptures. And um, <clears throat> the, um, the composer, uh, Linda Larkin from uh, Santa Fe, um, had a good ear to, um, to Eastern sound uh, in music. And, and uh, I, I found that... Um, I, and I do find that sound from other parts of the world can can open up different parts of receptivity within me. <clears throat> and uh, that's what we've, we found in and through the chants. And um, I really bring the, uh, the wisdom and the devotion of these three traditions to also remember uh, that, that we are all of the sacredness of the earth. Um, and um, that we are of the earth and that these religious traditions uh, need to keep referring back to that primary sacredness. Um, before we put a kind of a period there, um, I was very impressed when someone told me that these chants that you've written and that are recorded need to be approached with the same kind of openness and potency as the Tze prayers and chants have. And I found that to be the case. So thank you for that. Thank you for that prayer book. Thank you for everything we've talked about. Now let's turn to your newest book. Thank you. It is a great read. I mean, it is a thrilling read. And the place I'd like to go into it through the portal is to say that um, I lead the devotions for our weekly staff meeting. And I, it, I, I was called to offer <clears throat> an excerpt from your book as last week's devotion. And um, it is the section, and I've forgotten from which part of the book where you talk about the beloved disciple leading on the heart of God and how listening to the heart of God and the heart of anything is so crucial. Do you mind starting there or, or no, you know, start where you want. You can start there, obviously, or you can start with this was the idea of the book and this is why I needed to write this book. <laughs> either, either way you want to go. Yeah. No, I, I, I love speaking about uh, John the Beloved uh, and the tradition of, uh, that was so cherished in the Celtic world of, uh, of John leaning against Jesus at the Last Supper. And uh, in the Celtic world, it was said that John therefore heard the heartbeat of God and he became a symbol of the practice of listening, uh, listening deep within ourselves, uh, listening deep within one another and listening within the body of the earth for the beat of the sacred presence. Um, in the Celtic world, it, it is said that John is, is the beloved and uh, the beloved disciple who heard the heartbeat of God. Um, I'm aware that uh, many New Testament scholars uh, uh, are preferring to say that the beloved disciple was maybe Mary Magdalene and I'm really happy with that one as well. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, happy to go with either interpretation. 
that the beloved uh, is this one who symbolizes really each one, what each one of us is being invited to do. So that in this moment, um, in this um, gift of this present moment together with you, Ed, um, I believe uh, that, um, that what I'm most being invited to do is to listen to the beat of the sacred in you. And I think that when, when we hear the beat of the sacred in one another, in the other, I think we're radically changed. I think we, we choose to, uh, to want to honor the other. Uh, we uh, choose to want to be in relation to the heart of the other, what we would most uh, choose to be in relation to our own true center and true heart. Oh, that's so powerful. That's another moment where I want to stop and breathe. And um, I frequently say, and if I were a retreat leader, I now would send everybody off for two hours to just <laughs> savor that last paragraph and then come <laughs> back and share. Um, you're, you're such a powerful, not only teacher, but retreat leader as well. So tell us, I mean, the book has an amazing architecture to it. I love the fact that we do get a primer on Celtic spirituality and theology. And then we get to see how that is embodied in these amazing people you described for us. So kind of tell us about that, please. Yeah. Yes, I, I've just thought uh, of, of uh, someone who so influenced me uh, again when I was a young theological student. It was my, uh, my professor of church history uh, here in, uh, in Edinburgh. And uh, he believed uh, profoundly in, in a biographical way of teaching. Um, so he would really enter the, the life and the unfolding story of key figures historically in the church's history. And uh, I mean, he would have us on the edges of our seat. Uh, and when the class came to an end, uh, you know, we would think, oh no, don't stop. <laughs> and we'd have to wait until the, the next uh, lecture to come back and the story, he would pick up the story again. And um, I realized how, how much I was influenced by that uh, dear professor, Alec Chain. I think he, uh, he taught me something of the power of story and the power of personal story. So uh, that's, how I, that's how I teach. Uh, for the most part, I tend to teach through story and through the lives of others and sometimes bring my own story in as well. Um, but I, I, I think it's, um, it's a way of teaching that I deeply believe in. And, and that's the structure of this, of this new book, uh, the nine chapters. Each one is uh, focused on a particular uh, great Celtic teacher. And um, it's, you know, almost every one of those stories is filled with drama and uh, filled with tension because often these figures were standing up against the, the might of empire and the might of the imperial church uh, and often at great cost to themselves. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's how I shape it. Um, I think the, the other uh, thing that's, that's important, and it's a sort of thread that runs through it, as well as this uh, a continued theme of listening for the beat of the sacred. Um, uh, one of the things that I became uh, very aware of uh, early on in, in my um, reflections and research in, in Celtic spirituality and thought was the, uh, the emphasis on reawakening uh, to what we already most deeply know. Um, there's a, there, there's a, a, a very clear sense and celebration in the Celtic world that we are made of God, um, that, we, that we come forth from the womb of the one, uh, and that uh, deep within us is, in fact, the wisdom of the one from, from whom we have come, um, but that we have tragically fallen asleep to, to that wisdom. 
So uh, one of the things that I have found so liberating in that is that when, uh, when I tr uh, try to offer um, the perceptions of this tradition, um, I feel that all I'm um, setting out to do is to articulate what my listener or my reader already knows at a deep level. Um, I think the sort of imperial uh, uh, model that so much, so many of us received or were sort of influenced by in our upbringing gave us the impression that as teachers, as preachers, we, we were to tell others what they didn't know. Um, but uh, in, in this tradition, the role of the teacher or the preacher is to utter what the heart of the listener, the heart of the reader at some level already knows. Okay. Um, and in the book, I, I tell um, um, the, the story of uh, giving a talk in, in a small church in Virginia many years ago. And uh, I was at that stage talking in part about the book, Listening for the Heartbeat of God, which also is about the Celtic tradition. And uh, at, the, at the end of my talk, a, a woman in, in her 80s, I think, came very purposefully up the central aisle of the church. And she was walking so purposefully towards me with a copy of my book in her hand that the naughty boy in me thought, I think she's going to hit me over the head with that book. And uh, I, I was quite wrong. Uh, when she got up to me, she said, I want to show you what I wrote in this book after reading it. And she opened the cover and I saw that inside she had written, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> I, uh, I so often wish I had asked her for that copy of the book um, uh, because she had said so simply, so distinctly, what our experience is, I believe, when we hear truth uh, we, we may never have been taught it before. Um, we may never have been sort of consciously aware of it. But when we hear it, our deep response is, ah, yes, I knew it. Um, and uh, I, I think it, you know, that's the story that I cherish in part because it keeps reminding me as a teacher that my role, your role, um, is never to think that what we have to say is is not um, essentially already in the listener. Um, our role is to be liberators, to be finding some words to set free uh, the perception of truth and wisdom in the listener. I, uh, you awakened in me a memory of another story you tell in your book, and thank you for sending me an early copy of it. I'm really, really enriched by that about the Mohawk elder. Do you mind telling that story? Because it really does speak to the cultural crises in which we find ourselves right now. Yes. Yes, I, uh, that, uh, the context of that story was, was giving a talk many years ago in Ottawa in Canada. And um, the, uh, the hosts of the talk sense that there would be some common ground and resonance between the Celtic tradition and the uh, native tradition of the First Nations uh, tradition of Canada. Uh, so they invited a Mohawk elder to be uh, present for my talk. And the, um, the plan was that at the end of my talk, he would um, share observations and um, comment on any resonances that he saw. And uh, in the talk that night, I was focusing especially on some words from the prologue to John's gospel uh, that speak about the true light that enlightens every person coming into the world. And, uh, and spoke about that light uh, at the heart of uh, all people. Uh, at the end of my talk, this Mohawk elder, great, strong young man, um, he stood with tears in his eyes and he said, as I've been listening to these themes, uh, I've been wondering 
uh, where I would be tonight. I've been wondering where my people would be tonight. And I've been wondering where we would be as a Western world tonight if the mission that had come to us from Europe centuries ago had come expecting to find light in us. Uh, these words that, uh, that cut, cut my heart open uh, with a perception of truth. Um, and uh, we, we, can't, we can't undo uh, the horrendous arrogance uh, of a religion that has conquered, uh, triumphed in the name of so-called truth. Uh, but I do believe, um, I do believe that, that we are being called to, to a radical humility um, and uh, we're being invited to, uh, to approach one another with the gratitude and humility uh, that what is in, in the, in, at the heart of the so-called other uh, is the sacredness that we cherish uh, in our beloved teacher, Jesus. That he uh, should not be seen as an exception to humanity. He should be seen, I believe, and this is how the Celtic tradition celebrates him, as one who reveals uh, the sacredness that is at the heart of every human being. Oh, another deep breath. Uh, <laughs> John Philip, um, those first Europeans who came and did such horrendous things to First Nations people here were being, they were feeding on a theology that was the antithesis of seeing the light in everyone, rather seeing everyone as totally depraved. So none of us, I think, can embrace the nutrients of Celtic spirituality and theology without doing some deconstruction and reconstruction on that theology, which is the opposite. Can you talk a little bit about the fact that we just have to say something, whether we call it substitutionary atonement or something else, that we have to say something about that in every generation to deconstruct that? Yes. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm having an unusual moment in, in Scotland. I, um, I see the sun setting my, on my, your face. <laughs> it's really fl flooding into my room. I, I hope I'm not too bright for you. No, you look beautiful. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just grateful that you're joining us at such a late hour in, in uh, Scotland. Yeah, it's, it's important. Um, Ed, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you've steered the conversation in this direction because the... Uh, Yes, it is. It is um, so important um, to to, I suppose, uh, get the yes and the no um, uh, in relationship. I, I, I love what um, what Mahatma Gandhi um, said when when he said one of the most important words in the English language. He said is no. Um, um, and in his case, in, in his situation, it was saying no to the imperial power of Britain that had so dominated and wronged India. It was a saying no to uh, any any attempt to to forget and to abuse the uh, the difference between Muslims and Hindus. Uh, it was saying no to to this notion of untouchability. Um, but he, he said, um, uh, this is a, a powerful word and, and we need to find ways not only of speaking it, but living it um, and the courage of prophetically saying no to what is false. Uh, and then he, he also said uh, an even more powerful word is the word yes. 
uh, and he said uh, it's about saying yes to the true uh, sacredness at the heart of the other and it's about living that yes so uh, so we we've, we've been quite rightly uh, in our conversation, focusing on that most powerful word, uh, yes, and how we live the our yes to one another and to the earth. And it's important, I, I believe, in the Christian household to, um, to very clearly speak our no um, to part of our inheritance. And that is uh, an emphatic no to the doctrine of original sin. This, uh, this doctrine that has been used from the fourth century onwards to give the impression that uh, what is deepest in the heart of our being and what is deepest at the heart of the other is opposed to God rather than of God. Uh, so I want to say no, um, no, no to, to that. And I do so in part on the basis of also knowing that the most sacred moments in my life were the birth of my four children. Uh, in their faces, I could see something of the light of the one from whom we've all come. Uh, in their skin, I could smell the freshness of life's sacred origins. Uh, that moment as a father or a mother or a member of the family, when a child is born, we, we we know at some level this child has come through us, um, but this child is, is from a deeper wellspring than us. Um, and so I, I believe that existentially, we know about the sacredness of the other and the sacredness of the newborn. Uh, so this, uh, this teaching of uh, the doctrine of original sin that wants to say that what is most original in us or what is most essential to us is opposed to God rather than of God. Um, I see this as a perverse teaching. Um, and I think it was far too convenient for the empire to uh, essentially insist in the fourth century that it's, that it's religion teach this doctrine of original sin. Because again, that, that is most convenient to empire. Empire doesn't really want to be told that, uh, about the sacredness at the heart of every human being because then they can't use and abuse and control uh, the people. They have to find ways of honoring and reverencing and being in relationship with the people. Um, and then uh, the doctrine that, that is, is uh, built very much, I mean, I... I often think if, if you take out the doctrine of original sin from the great edifice of, of Western theology, if you take that piece out, the whole structure crumbles, collapses, because every other major doctrine is built on that one. And, um, and, and this is the case also with the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, this uh, doctrine that is... Um, been taught to give the impression that God somehow requires a payment in order to forgive. Um, and uh, again, I, I, I um, would say uh, this violates my deepest experiences of life and my deep, deepest experiences of love. Who, who are the people who have most truly and deeply loved me in my life uh, at times of wrong and failure on my part? Um, could I imagine them ever uh, requiring to be paid to forgive me? Um, it's a contradiction in terms when we speak about love. It cannot be bought. Um, I do believe that love is costly because it calls us to give our heart to one another, but it cannot be bought. Um, so the, uh, the Celtic tradition, just as it doesn't accept the doctrine of original sin, uh, so it, it, um, it teaches a very different understanding of the cross. Um, it sees uh, the cross as being the greatest expression uh, of the nature of love, and that is our desire to give ourselves for one another when we love. Uh, and this is a costly path, but it is never in the Celtic tradition, never is it about payment to God.
Breathing deeply again, John Philip. We must stop. I'm so grateful to you. Um, this is so nourishing. It also, John Philip, I want to say it is, um, it's medicine for where we are in the world. I know you're feeling it in Scotland. We're living it so intensely from day to day that we are so committed to our tribes, to our polarization, to our divisions, and consequently to what I have come to understand as an addiction to hating um, others. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Howard Thurman in his wonderful book, Jesus and the Disinherited, talks about empire always has in its wake hatred, deception, and fear. Um, the Celtic way offers this amazing alternative to all three of those. And the really redemptive alternative to seeing the light, the sacred in the heart of everyone. What if we took your prescription and as we talked with people who were different from us, sought first to listen to the truth in their hearts? What a different world. Yes. Yes, and interestingly, um, this Ariagina that I've referred to, this ninth century teacher, he refers to, to grace as, um, as the medicine, the medicine of grace. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's so important that, you know, what, we, we uh, uh, know that what medicine does is um, release the deepest uh, life-giving energies in our mm. system. Mm. Uh, and I, I believe so passionately that that's what we are being called to do for one another, to, to be releasers of these life-giving forces of, uh, of um, compassion, of, of, of wisdom, of imagination. And this is, I mean, this, this could lead us into another whole series of, uh, of, of, of um, conversations. Uh, the importance of the place of the imagination in the Celtic tradition. And this is one of, you know, I give one of the chapters to the sacred, sacredness of the imagination, because to be made of God is to be made of imagination. It's to be made of the great dreamer. Um, I love uh, Thomas Berry, the eco-theologian. He says, he said, uh, the universe is so amazing, it must have been dreamt into being. Ah. <laughs> And then, and then he goes on to say, and we are in such a mess, um, ecologically, politically, religiously, we're in such a mess. He says, we need to dream the way forward. We need to allow ourselves to imagine uh, what has never been, um, because that, that's what it is to be made of God. We're, we're imaginers. Uh, so um, one, one of the things I wanted to say uh, before we uh, uh, sign off is that we, we have a, a virtual book launch uh, Good. Up on, uh, on the 10th of July. Um, and if, if, um, if any of your folk uh, uh, would be interested in joining us, they'd be very welcome. And details on this uh, can be found on my, on my website, uh, which is www.earthandsoul.org. Um, and um, more details are coming, but um, we're going to, uh, at the virtual book launch, Rob Bell and I are going to be in dialogue around the, the themes of the book. And I've commissioned my son, uh, Cameron, who's a fiddler, uh, to compose a special piece of music for the event to uh, celebrate. I mean, we won't have champagne to be lifting, but we'll, we'll have a special piece of music. And my uh, dancing daughter is going to dance in honor of the sacred feminine, um, uh, uh, a special dance to St. Bridget. So. Well, lovely. <laughs> uh, one of the most holy moments I've ever had was sitting alone at St. Bridget of Kildare's uh, monastery for some silence, wonderful. Well, we do have to sign off, but what we will do, 
John Philip is during important moments throughout the conversation. We'll have photos of your books that we'll place up, including the newest, and also put a link to your website so that all of us can follow along in July for the launch. John Philip, thank you so much for this very sacred, heartfelt time. It's been marvelous. It's been so good to be with you again, Ed, and I'm looking forward to the day when, when physically we can uh, be together on Iona or on your side of the Atlantic. It's on its way, I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs> Blessings to you. Blessings, my friends, and thanks to all of you for joining us. This was really wonderful. Thanks for having been with me for two and a half years. Blessings always. Bye-bye.